I am Dr. Simon Hancock. I've been the curator of Haverford West Town Museum since April 1998, and I have a passionate interest in all aspects of social history, and especially aspects of Pembrokeshire's history that has been hitherto largely overlooked or forgotten. Colonists, Migrants and Refugees in the History of Pembrokeshire We are living through times when an extraordinary number of people around the world are on the move. In 2019, the number of global migrants reached 272 million as people look for economic opportunities to study or escape from political persecution, terrorism or indeed climate change. In all this sweeping population change, let us never forget that every experience of an individual or family represents a combination of personal push and pull factors which causes them to leave their own familiar surroundings to seek a life elsewhere. More recently, we have seen huge numbers of displaced people around the Mediterranean as a consequence of wars in the Middle East and indeed the consequences of the Arab Spring from 2011. Whether they choose or are forced to move, they all experience the challenges of facing new cultures and languages and are likely to face open discrimination or other forms of hostility. How has migration shaped and enriched this county? And what have the lasting impacts of these new arrivals been? Economic migration and refugees have in fact been a very significant feature of life in Pembrokeshire over the last two millennia. The geographical position of Pembrokeshire, close to Ireland and the wider economic hinterland of Bristol, one of England's largest ports, has ensured that migration and refugees figure more than you might imagine. We must never forget that the Romans were colonists. They arrived around 70 AD and established a tribal capital for the Demeti at Moridunum, Carmarthen, with a smattering of isolated villas and dwellings further west. The identification of a Roman fort at Whiston in 2012 promises even more exciting discoveries in the future. Following the end of Roman rule in West Wales, such as it was with the Romanised Demeti, we see a significant settlement into the county of an Irish people named the Desai, who took advantage of a political vacuum to move into southwest Wales. This migration may have occurred in the 5th century. There were sufficient numbers to establish Irish-speaking populations in the area until the language died out in the 8th century. They are remembered by the bilingual inscribed stones written in Latin and Irish Ogham. An early panegyric comes from the Book of Taliesin, old Welsh poetry of the heroic age, describes how the kings who have Irish descent ruled the kingdom of David, which contained the cantrefs of present-day Pembrokeshire and Carmarthenshire. Whether this Irish settlement resulted in permanent survival in existing place names is contested, given the phonological co-equivalence between Old Welsh and Old Irish during the 5th and 7th centuries. Heather James writes, how there were probably two distinct periods of Irish settlement into the area in the early and late 5th century. While the contacts with Ireland were both consistent and varied, the long coastline with its creeks and estuaries and mighty Milford Haven waterway enabled the raids of narrow single-masted ships. These Viking sea raiders appeared suddenly and without warning. Pembrokeshire was a useful staging post in the Irish Sea and Bristol Channel. There was probably small-scale immigration and settlement by Scandinavians as well, and they coexisted and integrated with the native population. There are undeniable Scandinavian forms of place names around the coast, including Skoma, Skokholm, Grassholm, Gateholm, Tusker Rock in Jack Sound, and Gosker Rock on North Beach in Denby. A convincing argument has been advanced how they influenced the name of Milford Haven itself, Myler Field the fjord with sandbanks. Moreover, there are inland settlement names which contain Scandinavian elements as well, including Wolf's Castle, Farthing's Hook, Skolloch, Goldtrop and Haygard. The human wave of people who arrived a century later were as keen on plunder as the Vikings, but they were intent on wholesale land acquisition by force from the native Welsh inhabitants. The Normans were opportunists par excellence, and following the death of William the Conqueror in 1087, they moved in from the English border. These Norman incursions brought a 
military response from Shisap Tudor, the king of Dehubath, but he died in battle near Brecon in 1093, and the breaks were then decisively off. According to the Chronicle of the Princes, the Bruti Tuasogion, the French overran David and Keredigion, which was not in their power before that, and made castles in them and fortified them. The Normans crossed the Taifi in a swift and probably unopposed thrust. And during the early years of Henry I's reign, both banks of the Clavai were colonised and secured by the Normans. The process of Anglicisation was continued with rigour by the English colonists who, who migrated from Devon and Somerset across the Bristol Channel, and as they did so, they transformed the ethnic profile as well as the landscape and the architecture of the region. No act of colonisation contributed so much to the Anglicisation of South Pembrokeshire as the arrival of the Flemish migrants somewhere between 1107 and 1112. They came in successive waves over perhaps several decades. They established a number of planted boroughs, including Whiston, founded by Wizzo Flandrensis, while Letard, nicknamed the Little King, gave his name to Letterston. Tancard, or Tancred, was perhaps their chieftain, and he is regarded as the founder of the capital of the Flemings, namely Haverford, later Haverford West. Givaldus Cambrensis describes the Flemings as a brave and robust people, ever most hostile to the Welsh, a people well versed in commerce and woollen manufacture, a people anxious to gain by land or sea in defiance of fatigue or danger, a hardy race equally fitted for the plough or the sword. Flemish names survive in existing place names in Pembrokeshire today, including Flemington, Castle Flemish, Tancredston and Lambston. They also heavily influenced the dialect of South Pembrokeshire. Even as late as 1914, a dictionary of South Pembrokeshire words and phrases covered sweat some 28 pages. These words were a reflection of Welsh, Norse, English, Norman and Flemish languages. As the number of English immigrants increased during the 12th and 13th century, the Flemish people gradually lost their separate identity, so that the chronicler, Ronald Figden, wrote in the 14th century how all traces of their language and identity had been lost. Other sources point to a longer-lasting survival. Lucas de Heer, a Flemish humanist and painter, travelled throughout England and Wales in the 1560s and 70s. He claims to have conversed with people in Pembrokeshire who still spoke Flemish well. The four ancient boroughs of medieval Pembrokeshire, Haverford, Tenby, Pembroke and Newport, were cosmopolitan communities where the prospects of trade and commerce brought people from all over Western Europe. Haverford's property deeds and documents are the finest surviving collection anywhere in Wales and re reveal numerous ethnic groups. Here we find Hugh the Fleming and Mabel his wife, one Perkin Graciot, and numerous other French and Flemish names. We find two money-lending Jews of Haverford in 1247 who operated under the King's official protection, while there were also three Norsemen from Haverford whose names are recorded amongst the Ostmen of Dublin in 1200. The Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland in 1169 from which English claims to sovereignty arose, instituted the imbroglio into Irish politics and affairs, which was to last the following eight and a half centuries. Given the short distance between Pembrokeshire and Ireland, some 70 miles or so at its shortest point, the presence of Irish migrants has been a constant in the history of Pembrokeshire. These waves of migrants usually coincided with political disturbance and unrest. Many of these came to escape from war, starvation, poverty, while others sought new opportunities in a more politically settled land. The occasional descent by masses of indigent Irish men stoked fears in local communities, so one of the official responses was to either ship them back to Ireland or to encourage them to move further east, out of the Shire. On the 8th of July, 1528, Treesap Griffith, a descendant of the great Sir Resap Thomas, complained to Cardinal Thomas Wolsey how 20,000 Irishmen, 
for the most part rascals and from the domain of the rebel Earl of Desmond had landed in Pembrokeshire within the previous year and he added how the king's town of Tenby is almost clean Irish as well the headmen to the commons. This was undoubtedly an exaggeration but eight years later George Owen the great Elizabethan chronicler of the county wrote how every third, fourth or fifth village in Truce or Castle Martin was an Irishman and he even went so far as to declare how in some parishes all the inhabitants apart from the priest were Irish. They brought with them a taste for whisky which they distilled in large quantities and which they hawked about. Another wave of Irish came in 1628 and 1629 arriving with passes granted by local Irish officials. Many were transported at three shillings a head and they were unloaded into small creeks and bays where they were hardly likely to encounter the authorities. Some ship owners profited greatly from this human traffic. On one occasion a ship of ten tons took over 70 migrants who were crammed into his vessel. This does indeed seem an echo of the human trafficking which is taking place in our own time where desperate scenes are daily played out in the Mediterranean and in the English Channel. The contribution of black and minority ethnic sailors in building up the trade and maritime commerce of Pembrokeshire ports, especially Milford Haven, will always remain conjectural. The crew list of Victorian and Edwardian vessels allows an analysis of birthplaces of crew members, but this information is simply unavailable for earlier periods. Black sailors must have been on ships of vessels sailing from the West Indies, especially Antigua and Jamaica, which were regularly sailing to Haverford West between 1720 and 1760. They would have brought a variety of goods, including that most precious of commodities, sugar, which was one of the financial sinews of the British Empire. Such black people that are encountered in Pembrokeshire records invariably, but not universally, appear due to encounters with the law. Some black people appear as peripatetic entertainers in local fairs. In October 1907, one of them was styled Prince Samud, and he appeared at the Portfield Hiring Fair and gave a marvellous performance, including thought reading and illusions. Earlier, a black member of the Welsh troop, which exhibited at Her Branston Fair in 1851, was obliged to leave rather quickly through the fear of violence which was expressed against him and he couldn't take any chances. Most black people came to, to Pembrokeshire through local ports since before the advent of the railways in 1853 transportation was long and arduous. Numbers are impossible to ascertain but it's estimated that nationally 3% of ship crews were probably black, Asian and ethnic minority sailors. Occasionally, they were uh, obliged to commence court action for non-payment of wages. Thus, in November 1847, at the Pembroke Borough Petty Sessions, J. Ellie, who was a black man of the William Wallace, which was sailing from the uh, East Indies to Pembroke Dock, took legal proceedings against Captain Small for non-payment of his wages. The latter won the action by citing various acts of disobedience what factor racism might have been in this judgment is impossible to ascertain, but must surely have been some factor. The punishment meted out to Abraham Brown, a black man at the Borough Sessions in Pembroke in 1862, was harsh even by the standards of the time. He received six months with hard labour for stealing threepence worth of hay and some old bones. Black sailors who were discharged from their ships were likely to be picked up for vagrancy. Thus, we find Fred Frederick Fredrickson from St. Cruz in the West Indies. He received a month with hard labour for begging in the back lane in St. Mary's Parish, Haverford West, in 1862. The status of Haverford West as an important port with an Atlantic trade ensured that they were significant migrations of individuals from continental Europe. The presence of the only Moravian church in Wales was an indication of these external influences. One such arrival, which was to have 
important implications for the commercial and financial development of the town were Samuel and Moses Levi. They were born at Frankfurt in Germany and they were Jewish brothers who arrived Haverford West via Swansea. They were baptised into the Christian faith and assumed the surname of one of their uh, friends and mentors, a man named Phillips. Samuel opened the Haverford West Bank in 1783 and it thrived until 1825 when it failed during a national banking panic. Pembrokeshire has been a place of refuge for refugees fleeing rebellions and civil war in Ireland. In 1641 the Great Irish Rebellion saw people fleeing across the Irish Sea with tales of atrocities. The heightened tension of what went on in Ireland considerably increased the political temperature and the following year the whole of the British Isles was convulsed in civil conflict. The refugees in Pembrokeshire were of course Protestant and they were allocated £100 by Parliament towards their relief, although we're not sure whether these funds were ever distributed. A little over 150 years later, Ireland was convulsed with the Great Rebellion of 1798. The United Irishmen sought to establish an independent Irish Republic. Only in County Wexford did the rebels achieve any success, taking Inniscorthy and Wexford. Both sides committed atrocities, one of the most infamous occur occurring at Scullabog on the 5th of June 1798, when a hundred loyalists were locked in a barn which was set on fire. British military victories were invariably followed by the massacre of Irish Catholic prisoners. In June, Haverford West was filled with unfortunate Irish refugees, including one lady whose husband had been butchered by the rebels. Several vessels came into the town crowded with fugitives, and it was estimated there were between a thousand and fifteen hundred refugees in the town. The inhabitants raised funds to feed and house them, including private lodgings and even erecting tents. A plea to the government seemed to attract lukewarm sympathy. The Home Secretary, the Earl of Portland, was more interested in censuring the flight of military officers and clergymen who exposed themselves to accusations of dishonourable and disgraceful conduct in leaving their posts in Ireland than actually providing much by the way of practical help. There seemed to have been few refugees from the French Revolution since Pembrokeshire was not geographically close to the continent, although the occasional Frenchman does appear. Locally, one was an individual named Duvin, who was, who was attracted notoriety by appearing as a second to John James, one of the protagonists in a famous duel fought in September 1799, when Samuel Fortune of Haverford West was killed. Pembrokeshire was host, at least for a time, for waves of migrants from Ireland, which was devastated by the potato blight in the mid-19th century, between 1845 and 1849. Some three million people depended upon the potato as their staple food, and the consequences of the blight, which in 1846 destroyed three quarters of the crop, were truly devastating. Over a million people died, and a further million emigrated, so Ireland's population fell by between 20 and 25 per cent. There was particular anger at how 400,000 Irish people had died of starvation and disease, while at the same time thousands of ships were exporting Irish-grown food to Bristol, Liverpool, Glasgow and London. There was also bitter resentment at the attitude of the British government, which spent a mere 0.5% of GDP over a five-year period in famine relief. About 200,000 of these migrants eventually arrived in Britain. Pembrokeshire witnessed the arrival of famine ships from Ireland. In one recorded case, nearly 300 men, women and children arrived off the coast in April 1848. Their ship was shamefully deserted by the captain near Angle, leaving the people to trudge to Pembroke. Upwards of a hundred were housed in a large malt house on the green, and the following morning they were on their way heading east for Newport in Monmouthshire. Technological and transport changes brought their own wave of migrants to Pembrokeshire. The arrival of the railways at Haverford West, Nayland, Pembroke Dock and Milford Haven brought dramatic changes in the way in which people lived. The county was opened up as never before, with benefits for the export of agricultural produce and for places like Tenby, a palpable boost 
as a tourist destination. A case study in this regard is provided at Nayland, where the railway opened in 1856 and was followed by the inauguration of a steam ferry service to Waterford and Cork. 19th century Nayland had a distinctly Irish character, with numbers of Irish-born residents and prominent Irish people, and it retained this until the Irish boats went north to Goodick in 1906. For places like Pembroke Dock, whose entire raison d'etre was the establishment of the Royal Dockyard in 1814, there was a significant influx of skilled workers and artisans from the West Country, and uh, in this respect, these migrants were the founders of the dockyard town. In this reflection on the role of colonists, migrants and refugees in Pembrokeshire's history, no chapter provides a more interesting analysis of attitudes to refugees than that of the Belgian colony, which made its home in Milford Haven between 1914 and 1919, during the First World War. The German army invaded Belgium on the 4th of August 1914. About 1 1.5 million, or 20% of the population of Belgium, fled and became refugees, mostly to Holland, which was neutral in the war, and uh, about a quarter of a million came to Britain at one time or another during the war. Defending the honour and integrity of poor little Belgium became an important reason in explaining why Great Britain was at war. In September and October 1914, some 25 Ostend trawlers arrived at Milford Haven with their crews. Some of them brought family and even household furniture. They were especially welcome since much of the domestic fleet of trawlers had been taken by the government for minesweeping and anti-U-boat patrols. The immediate arrival seemed to have been better off and the departure from Belgium less hurried and less desperate than those who arrived a little later. The later uh, refugees came via Folkestone and took the train west. Some students of history remembered the early arrival from the Low Country, that of the Flemings, in the early 12th century, and so they saw the appropriateness of their arrival in Pembrokeshire. Around 1,100 to 1,400 Belgians remained in Milford Haven during the war, and so one in seven of the population of the town was a refugee. Other refugees were housed at Fishguard, Narbuth, Tenby, Dinas, Newport and Letterston, but they mostly left by 1915 to seek employment in England. A King Albert school for Belgian children was opened in Milford Haven in 1915 and was staffed by three Flemish-speaking teachers and the exiled community marked the King's birthday and the National Independence Day with colourful spectacles and displays. The relationship with locals was not a universally harmonious one, especially as the war began to, to bite and casualties soared and the cost of living escalated. There were two Belgian fishermen strikes in 1915 and 16, and the accusation was made that the Belgians did not want to work. There was also occasional fights and altercations with locals and stone flowing between Belgian and Milford youths. Nevertheless, there was genuine regret when the Belgians left in March 1919 and the Belgian trawler owners gave a handsome granite memorial to the town as a thank offering. This was unveiled in March 1919. Great Britain's efforts in fighting two world wars were aided immeasurably by the active participation in military and logistical spheres by people from across the empire and indeed many who were no part of it. The Merchant Marine had many black, Asian and Chinese sailors and they were given sustenance and shelter at the Bethel Sailors Rest at Milford Haven. During the First World War it housed the crews of 148 ships and they'd either been lost by mine, torpedo or storm. One eyewitness account described desperate Chinese sailors walking up Hamilton Terrace barefooted. The crews of neutral vessels could not get home, and so they assisted the war effort in other ways, especially the timber camps at Slebich, Wiston and Nevin. They were a mixture of Finns, Russians, Norwegians, Danes, Dutch, Greeks, Italians and an American or two. They were employed by the Board of Trade to cut down timber, which was then shipped to the Western Front. Pembrokeshire saw a significant arrival of Russians, mainly Jews, in the summer of 1918. Labour battalions were formed of non-naturalised Russians living in Britain to perform military-related manual labour. 
on the 9th Labour Battalion arrived at Scoveson Fort near Nayland and they were joined by 600 members of the 8th Battalion of, uh, in October 1918. And a number of these uh, Russian, Latvian, uh, Jewish men stayed after the war and married local women. From late Victorian times, Pembrokeshire's had a significant presence of Italian migrants. They were typically engaged in peripatetic entertainment like organ grinders. We find various names between 1909 and 1918, including D. Palmer Loretto, Albert Corsi, Pascal Rial, Giuseppe Giaconte and Annie Giovanni. Haverford West, Pembroke Dock and Tenby all had their Italian restaurants before 1914 and they were operated by a man named Amo Amoretti. He regularly traded on a Sunday, despite licensing laws, and he was sanguine about regularly being fined, because, of course, the income he derived on a Sunday was so lucrative. He happily parted with a fine, because he was making so much money on the Sabbath. He must have been one of the 20,389 Italians living in the United Kingdom uh, in 1911, and one of the thousand that was living in Wales. As an Italian reservist, he closed his Bridge Street Italian restaurant and put up a notice in 1914 saying he would be reopening by Christmas since peace ought to reign in Europe by then. What a shame. We know, sadly, that was not the case. It was four, more than four years before peace came back to Europe. The Fecci family arrived in Tenby and they opened a successful ice cream parlour in 1935, while in Milford Haven it had its noted Rapiotti and Todaro's um, hairdressing salon thrives to this very day. The Second World War saw another significant arrival of Belgian refugees, and interestingly, some of them were coming to the place of their birth. They'd been born in Milford Haven in 1914-18, they went back to Belgium. In 1914, the Nazis arrived, and they find themselves as refugees a second time to the, in the place of their birth. But we also find lots of German and Italian prisoners of war. There were 402,200 German prisoners of war in the UK in 1946, and a large camp on the Haven Road, Haverford West, housed around 600 of them. Many were employed in agricultural labour. Of the 25,000 who chose to remain in the United Kingdom after 1947, a considerable number continued to live, work and marry in Pembrokeshire. Likewise, a number of the 76,855 Italian prisoners of war who were in this country in 1943 remained in Pembrokeshire after 1945. Former allies as well as former enemies maintained a strong community identity, but for, for different reasons. Some German and Italians may not wanted to have returned to their devastated homelands, but many Poles, the thought of returning to a country dominated by communism was simply not an option. Around 200,000 Poles remained in the United Kingdom, and in 1951, 162,339 citizens listed Poland as their birthplace in the decennial census. Modern migrants to Pembrokeshire have been overwhelmingly motivated by economic considerations. The advent of the oil industry brought very large numbers of people into the county. These enterprises brought significant migration from all parts of the country, including Scotland, Ireland and even overseas. In 2011, around 5,000 people who were born either in the EU or, or non-EU countries were domiciled in, um, in Pembrokeshire. And of course, in the last few years, we've had a few Syrian families have settled in Pembrokeshire under the auspices of the Home Office's Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme. By 2018, seven families had been settled in, in the county. And of course, very recently, there was the arrival of refugees who were being housed at the Penali training camp near Tenby. The story of Pembrokeshire is a story of migration of colonists and refugees, one stretching back 2,000 years or more. It's a constant in human experience. We may think we are faced with issues and political discourse unique to our own times, but history tells us something very different.